Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast. If you are a solopreneur, a consultant, a speaker coach, and you're working by yourself, and you are wondering how do you scale your business? So A, first of all, you don't have to do everything. Uh, B, things get done better because you can take off the plate everything you hate doing and don't do well. And three, actually earn more money because you can spend the time doing the things that you're supposed to be doing instead of all the other things that need to be done. If you're in that situation, then I welcome you to enjoy today's episode of the Author to Authority podcast. Joining me is Jay Agner. And he's the CEO of GDAQA, a software testing agency. He's also a father of a five. He's a student pilot. He's an amateur astrophotographer. Now, his five for five. I found this really interesting. 5 a.m. wake up, workout, stretch, meditate, and journal has been something friends, family members, and fans of his podcast called The First Customer have keyed in on as something they really appreciate. And I, I love that idea of your of the podcast, The First Customer, because he talks to founders of businesses about how they got their first customer. Welcome to the show, Jay. Thank you so much, Kim. That was a, a brilliant introduction. That was, uh, <laughs> I'm already flattered. I could like, I don't have to say anything. No, that's, that's great. I love it. I love it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So, Jay, this is your first time on the Author to Authority podcast, and I would love for you to just take a little bit of time and just share more of your journey. And, and how did you become the CEO of a software testing agency? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, as you mentioned, uh, I, I started out doing consulting as kind of a one man shop. Um, I did software quality assurance. I went to school to, to make video games. I thought I was going to go out and make the next Grand Theft Auto or the next big video game. And then I realized that industry sucks. Uh, it's very hard. It's very cutthroat. It's very, you have to live in a couple places in the world. I mean, you know, it's changed a little bit with COVID, but I mean, for the most part, it's California or Texas or, you know, New York are kind of the big hubs. And I didn't, you know, um, I wasn't the best programmer. I, I went to school for programming. I got my bachelor's in computer science but i went to school with like people that named stuff after like they like they were like really smart like really like you could tell and i would probably equate it to i always tell people it's funny i'm talking to you because i always use this analogy i say it's like being an author like anybody can write a book but to like to really write a top 10 bestseller like there's something special about that and being able to kind of you know uh, organize your thoughts in a way that really um, you know, can kind of step above the mm -hmm. rest. So that's why I've always thought about programming. That just wasn't me. So I got bailed out. I got lucky. I got um, interviewed to be a tester for a, a games company actually up here in Philadelphia uh, while I was in school uh, down in Florida and um, kind of left at the opportunity, moved up here. And the rest is history. Bounced around a bunch of different places. Um, and then my wife was long, you know, she was an over, overnight uh, long-term care pediatric nurse, which uh, if, if nobody's been to one of those facilities, uh, I would say probably don't go because it's like a very, you know, intense, you know, kind of sad place seeing these kids in the state. And it was a lot on my wife. And I saw that and I wanted to get her out of there. Um, and uh, I applied for Uber, who turned me down because my license was like from a different state. And it was like this whole thing. And uh, I was applying for overnight stock boy jobs at Walmart. Like I was trying everything to do, like, how do I work a nine to five and then like work another job to supplement the secondary income. And luckily I found uh, Upwork, which was elance.com at the time they merged with uh, Upwork at some point. Um, and I just started picking up gigs for consultancy, which is why I think I'm such a, I call myself a consulting evangelist and a delegation evangelist today, because I think everybody should consult uh, everybody's experience that they've had at some point, you know, somebody will pay you for that, right? Somebody will pay yeah. you to whether it's in restaurants or whatever. So, um, I mean, at one point I had three or four different jobs. I was going to the stairwell during my break, taking calls. I was doing it after work. I was doing it in the mornings. I was doing whatever. I mean, I had like multiple jobs and I had a problem saying no to money. And I, I figured out, uh, hey, if I have somebody else work for me uh, and I pay them $25 an hour and the customers pay me $50 an hour, then I can make $25 an hour doing nothing. Right. I mean, it's a crazy thought when you like have that realization and that was really it i mean i remember i was in this house i was running up and down the stairs with my wife i'm like here's the one like i got the opportunity they said they're fine with somebody else doing the work instead of me i've got a guy that'll do it 
Um, and that first employee actually is still working with me today. He's a guy I worked with for 15 years, you know, across my career. And he's still one of my oldest tenured employees at JDAQA. And um, just kind of started to build, build the business out from there um, and started with one other employee. And now we have 60 people and three teams, one in the United States, one co-located team in Mexico and an organic team that I've built in the Philippines. So we've got uh, a pretty strong organization now. And it all started with just that, you know, I, I almost hate to say the hustle mentality because it's been bastardized a bit, but it, I mean, that's what it was. It was trying to make more you know, money by having the same amount of hours in the day and uh, kind of grew it to what it is today. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think there is a misconception around the word hustle. It's got a bad connotation to it, but as an entrepreneur, how else are you going to grow your business unless you go out there and you get sales? I mean, unless you buy a pre-established business that has a marketing and a sales team, mm -hmm. if you're running this by yourself, you have no choice but to hustle because if you don't hustle, there ain't no money, honey. <laughs> That's dead on. I love that. I love that phrase. And that was one of the biggest things I had to accept. I remember sitting somewhere with a client of mine and we were at a bar somewhere and this lady was sitting next to me and I had like a nice like I would, like dress clothes on. She's like, oh, you're you must be the salesman for your company. And I'm like, I'm not a salesman. And like I, at that moment, I kind of thought like, wait a minute, like I am. I am the salesman for my company. And once I kind of realized that and kind of digest, because nobody wants to, there's some book I was reading that said like name the top five things you think of when you hear the word salesman. And it's like pest, annoying, like, you know, uh, pushy, like all these things. And like, everybody's afraid to be that, you know, that, that uh, version of themselves. But once somebody kind of explained it to me, like you were, you're giving people value. You're sharing something with them that you think that can actually help them. If you are just like, you know, knocking on doors and like trying to sell everybody everything, then yes, you're going to be annoying to people. But if you connect with people that you think could use your service and yeah. you are confident in the service you're providing, then you're, you're really, it's not a annoying kind of conversation. If people say no, then you go into the next one. It's, it's the, it's the say not, you know, hear no nine times. And the 10th is a yes is what kind of keeps you going as a, as a entrepreneur yeah. and a business owner that has to do sales. You know, it's funny you say that because one of the, one of my best clients actually wrote the book Selling from the Heart, Larry Levine, because he wanted to change how the world saw salespeople. And he wanted salespeople to be authentic and genuine, just like you said. And I think that is so true that, you know, one thing you said that just kind of impacted me, and it's been my story as well. When I first started learning how to sell, you know, I was under people who were teaching, you know, manipulation tactics, all this other kind of aggressive stuff. And it wasn't me. And I failed miserably. And I thought, okay, I guess I'm not good at sales and all this other kind of stuff. But I finally found someone that I worked with who taught me that it's okay to sell authentically. It's okay to develop relationships. It's okay to care about the people that you are selling stuff to. Right. That is allowed. Yeah. And and once I was able to be me and be kind and be caring and be respectful and actually sell them something that they need, man, life got a whole lot better because I, I thrived in that situation because it was everything that I, I was and I am. I still am. I I still do most of the sales right now for my business. I'm hoping that will change in the next year or so. But I really love the relationship part. Mm -hmm. And even if I ever, you know, develop a full skill sales team and all these other things, I think I'm still going to do some of the selling just because I love doing it. <laughs> yeah. Once you, once you switch from, like you said, from uh, just trying to manipulate or just trying to get sales or just the way that like everybody views sales to, providing value for people that, that you honestly believe you can provide, then it's easy and it's fun. And you, you hear pain points and it's like, it becomes a, and it's not a game, but it becomes a, a constant learning lesson. You're constantly hearing stuff. I'm like, I, I get excited now when I, I mean, I used to shy away from things like people would, you know, companies would say, Oh, we don't, you know, we only want W2 employees. Like we don't want contractors or an agency like you have. And I would go, okay, that's fine. And I would like walk out the door and I'd be fine. Now I love it. 
now I'm like, I eat, you know, that's, I've got my list of things in my head that I know I can go after. I've got all my pain points that I know that they're feeling with those W2 employees versus having kind of a scalable, flexible team like we have. So you learn those things and all those no's that you hear kind of become your ammunition later on for, for, you know, landing those sales and you hear it again from the next person. And that guy goes, Oh, well, that is a great point. And you kind of, you, you build up that repertoire of, of confidence and, and points and all that stuff. So it becomes, like you said, it is fun. It's fun learning about your more about, you learn more about your business by selling than you do working at it, I think. Right. And that's where a lot of the disconnect yeah. comes in the bigger companies because the salesmen are out selling whatever stuff and the people who are doing the work are going, wait a minute, we don't even, we don't even, that's not even what our platform does. But if you're doing both, um, you kind of have the unique perspective of like being able to learn about your product, apply those lessons to your your actual company and kind of it's a big circle. So it's fun. Yeah. And the, the one other thing I, I loved what you said was, you know, uh, you know, getting no nine times and then, you know, waiting for that 10th. And this manager that really taught me how to sell, one of the things she taught me was to track my numbers. How many no's do I have to get to get a yes? Right. And when I started tracking it and I was really practicing and I was out there doing it all the time, within a very short space of time, it got to the point where it only took me two to three no's to get a yes. Mm -hmm. You know, but even let's say it takes 10 no's or seven no's or 15 no's, right? It depends on what you sell, how much it costs, all these different things. But if you get used to the word no and it becomes your friend, you're like, yeah, another no down. I'm closer to that. Yes, that yes yep. is coming, right? Yep. And and it doesn't, no's don't affect you anymore. The other thing I learned was, was that I'm not everybody's cup of tea and they're not mine. And yep. to be honest, some of the people have said no to me. I'm like, I found out later what they were really like. And I'm like, oh, I'm so glad they said no to me. I'm yes. so glad I don't have to work with this person. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's definitely. And that's a, I'll say that's a perk of living through the the nose and living through bad clients. Right. I mean, as you grow, grow a business, you get the luxury of saying no to people instead of them saying no to you. Right. And like you get to you identify the ones that are troublemakers, the ones that may be trying to cheap out on you or whatever. And you're like, you know what? This just isn't a great fit from the start. Um, and, you know, you have to I think you have to be in business for a little while to, to be able to, yeah. to do that. But once you once you kind of get that under your belt, I think that's a that's a nice little perk of, of, of running a business. Well, one thing I found was was that once I started really raising my prices, a lot of those, you know, penny pinchers and all that, mm -hmm. they fell off. Yep. Now, it doesn't mean I don't occasionally get a bad customer. You know, I have i can't say that I don't. Just came through a situation where I'm kind of like, yeah, I think I'm done with that person. <laughs> don't think I'll be working with them again. But, you know, you worked with them the once. We got their project done. They're, you know, but it's kind of like, hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Was that worth the money? No. Yeah. Because you know what? Sometimes it doesn't matter how much you pay pay they pay you. You know, if they're putting you under so much stress, it's just not worth it. Yeah. Say no. Yeah. I think I think you need you definitely have to live through some of those, I think, as a business owner mm -hmm. to to appreciate to, to identify and then appreciate not working with those people. And then as you grow your organization, you have people that work under you. Your job is to protect those people. And if you see yeah. that your clients aren't treating those people well, uh, it's time to pull the ripcord. And that's kind of another one of the things I learned as I grew my business. And you, you figure out like what your role is and what your, what your actual job is supposed to be at your organization once you delegate yeah. and you start to build an operations layer underneath you is that you know, there's certain things that you have to do that are your job. And my job mm -hmm. is to, you know, sales, marketing, business development stuff, because I enjoy it. But my my internal job is to be a cheerleader, to be supportive and to protect my guys and to always make them, you know, because they don't have to work for me. Nobody ever has to. I, don't, I mean, I'm lucky that I have the people that I have. And I feel like that's something that people lose sight of is you're lucky to have people working for you. Like they could go work anywhere. It's 2023. Anybody could get on Upwork or Fiverr or go online or go wherever. They could go work wherever. So like if you have good people, uh, you better be treating them right because, you know, you're lucky to have them. Yeah. And you know what? 
ultimately, if you've got good employees, they're going to be with you forever. Yeah. That client, on the other hand, right? And and yeah, like you know, nowadays, like you see, you see so many things on the internet about bad managers, bad companies. You know, they don't care about their people, and and to me, that's that's horrible, just horrible. I I'd rather fire a client and keep a good employee. I can always get another client. I can't always get a really good employee. Mm-hmm. And I, but it's, it's almost like a throwback to the old days. Like the almost that almost shouldn't happen anymore. There's so many options. People are just kind of stuck in their ways and scared to leave somewhere, you know, because they have a job. But it's like there's so many, you know, people will, people will treat you right if it's a good organization. If they're not, then yeah. don't be there. You know, go somewhere else. Like, don't be mistreated. Don't let these big, especially the big companies that don't really care about you anyway. You're just a number. Like, don't don't put up with that. You know, work with somewhere that's work for somewhere smaller that that, that you make an impact. And maybe maybe you know, some people like working in a big company. That's fine. But uh, you know, I, I I don't understand. I mean, I do understand because people need a paycheck and they need to live. But at the same time, you know, I think people get beat up too much just to keep the job they have because they're scared that they won't get another one. But it's like, dude, come on. Like there's, <laughs> there's so many companies in, in this world that, that would treat you better. Uh, you know, don't, don't let people tell you that you're not worth what you're worth. Yeah. Well, I think at this point we're going to transition and I want to give you some time to talk about how to grow your business from a one person shop. I think we've talked a little bit about it, but I know you've come prepared with some specific things and I want to make sure I give you time uh, to share those with the audience today. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I mentioned I'm a delegation, uh, evangelist. Um, I think people wait way too long to hire a really good operations person. Uh, I am extremely lucky and extremely blessed to have the best chief operating officer in the world, uh, Autumn Bruno, who's my right hand lady. And she's been with me through thick and thin. Um, and I think every day I appreciate her more, but having a really strong person that can run the day to day operations in your business is a must. Mm -hmm. And part of that is uh, trust, right? You have to yeah. trust, you have to, it, number one, trust the people. Number two, you have to let control go because a lot of people that yep. I talk to that are trying to do this, uh, I can't because I can't, I, just, I can't give this. You have to, you have to let the reins go uh, and give some of these things to other people. Um, you have to realize that some people are better at other things than others, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, some people are really good at operations. Some people are really good at uh, organization. Some people are really good at sales. People are really good at marketing. And like, not everybody is not going to be good at everything. And I think, no. um, you know, finding the strengths in the people that you hire, uh, hiring people on a contract basis, I think is huge as well, especially for when you're trying to grow your business from, you know, a smaller state. You know, you don't have to hire W2. You don't have to hire, like, hire somebody for 10 to 20 hours a week. See if it works. See if it yep. fits. Um, uh, and delegation. Um, is by far the, you know, the, the, the most important thing you could ever do. And that's either that part of that's operations, part of that's your day to day, make a list of the things that you do as a business owner every single day, make a list of what yeah. you do every week, make a list of what you do every month. And then what you do is you hire a virtual assistant or uh, an executive assistant, whatever you want to do. And you start delegating tasks. You don't have to answer every email. You don't have to schedule every call. You don't have to, you know, yeah. uh, do every single thing in your life. And paying the, you know, ten to fifteen dollars an hour for somebody offshore to do that for you. And this kind of goes back, you know, I used to the four hour work week was like a book I read when I was like twenty, and then I read it again when I was like thirty five, and I was like, all right, some of this stuff's a little far fetched. But the big piece that I drew from that was that, you know, use the the uh, the pay difference in the economy around the world. I mean, it's just, you know, the cost of living is different around the world. You know, for mm -hmm. here, it's it's a certain amount, for somewhere else, a certain amount. So you can pay somebody, you know, $10 an hour, $5 an hour, $7 an hour, $15, whatever it is, you kind of find that range that fits. 10 hours a day or 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week of that person's time uh, unlocks a magical yeah. amount of time for you, right? And one of my guys I was mentoring at this uh, Pay It Forward program for the Philly Chamber of Commerce that I'm part of, um, 
he kind of had the realization with the painter in his house. He was like, man, he's like, I was trying to paint my room. And I was like, it was all this trim I had to do. It was like taking me forever. I had to get all the stuff. And he's like, and then he's like, you know what? I just paid somebody like 300 bucks to do it. And he's like, and they were done. He was like, and I saved so much time. I was off doing this other thing. I was building this product that I wanted to build. He's like, mm-hmm. it's so crazy. It's just like, yes, like that is delegation in a nutshell. Like take the things that are taking up your time and hand them off to somebody else. I always tell people like, if something feels like work for me and I know I'm, I'm in a unique position because I've built this business up over the last like decade, but if something feels like work for me at this point, I delegate it. Like if it's not something that I'm passionate about, I'm not going to do a good job. So if it's yeah. sales and business dev and marketing, yes, I love that stuff. I'm going to crush it because I absolutely love it. But if it's scheduling calls and, you know, uh, uh, you know, just doing the, the kind of day-to-day work that just takes up your time and eats up hours a day, uh, I hand it off. Right. And, I, and that's what I mentioned, having a great operations person. Um, my job is to land the sale. It's to find the people, land the sale and then hand it off to my uh, uh, amazing onboarding team, which Autumn heads. Um, they do a scoping call where they get all the information about the project. They, she's got a great list that she's built up over the years of, of questions to ask. Then uh, we have a team that does the contracts. They fill out all the contract information. We, I, you know, we double check that. We go through it together as a team and then we send that out. So like, if you really think about it, my only job is sales and marketing and like maybe some biz dev stuff, right? So uh, to grow your business, uh, you have to let go, you have to delegate, you have to uh, you know, bring in some part-time people that are gonna take the load off you. And I think that's my biggest message to anyone. And I tell everybody all the time and I hear it all the time. They go, well, I'm not quite there yet. I'm like, well, if you're not there yet, you're, you, you know, that's your next piece. Like you gotta get rid of the stuff that's slowing you down because otherwise, yeah. You know, we all have 24 hours in a day. We all have the same amount of time in a day. And if you can't spend it landing new clients and you have to be putting out fires or you have to be filling out contracts, or you have to be doing whatever, then you're not, you're missing time to sell stuff. And even your sales window is even smaller than that. I mean, what, it's like six hours a day. Like maybe you have to mm-hmm. sell to people. So like if you're not out there hitting the pavement or answering, you know, phone calls or doing whatever to people that are trying to get business from you, um, then you're leaving money on the table and you're slowing your growth down. So I think it, it's a... Yeah one of those problems you have to pay to get out of, you know, you pay mm-hmm. some upfront to, to get a virtual assistant, to get an operations person. And then once you do that, uh, the world just opens up and everything slows down and you go, wow, like, am I working enough? Like, I don't know if, <laughs> should I be working more? Mm-hmm. Because like, you know, the, this whole mechanism is just running. And uh, if you can get to that point, um, you know, I think life, life becomes fun again and a business owner becomes fun again. And uh yeah. So those are my main kind of points is, is delegation is like by far, you know, the number one thing. You know, when you talk about having to let go of control, I think that's one of the huge issues right now, recently, well, at the time of recording, uh, would have been a few months ago. If you're listening to it now, uh, I lost my book project manager. She had some health things going on. She needed to leave. She was valued. You know, we left on great terms, but I had to bring in a new person and we were having a conversation and I basically said to her, listen, I am not looking to micromanage you. I am not Mm because I hate micromanaging, Uh, you know, and I gave her the freedom to make the position her own within some boundaries. Right. Okay. Like there were certain things. Okay. If you want to completely change how, you know, the systems in RTI publishing, we need to have a discussion about that. But if, if you figure out a better way to do something and it works for you and it works for the clients, go for it. I don't care. Right. Yeah. Cause, cause that's not, that's, I don't need to micromanage that. Now, if I've hired the right person now, doesn't mean I'm don't take responsibility for it. And it also doesn't mean that I don't assess it. Mm hmm but I don't need to micromanage it. I just need to keep an eye on it and make sure that it's working. But if she finds a way of doing it, that's completely different than the way I figured out how to do it. Doesn't bother me at all. No, because I'm hiring her to, to manage, to take care of all the book projects. I don't have time anymore to take care of the book projects and grow the business and, you know, run the podcast and, you know, all of these things that, uh, I need to be directly responsible for, you know, uh, it's my podcast. I'm not paying someone else to be the host of my podcast, right. my podcast. Right. I do the interviews. Now I may pay people to do stuff in the background around the podcast, but 
you know, doing these episodes are my responsibility. And to be honest, it's something I love doing. So I have no intention of giving it up. Uh, but I, I loved what you said about that delegation. And I can remember when I brought on my first person, she was actually my best friend. Now, the first person I brought on was an editor because there was a lot of things I could do and I was doing, but my editing was not good. So she was the first person I brought on. But eventually, within a year or so, be she became the book project manager mm -hmm. for RTI Publishing because she had that mindset. I mean, I was getting bogged down and bored. And it's like, I mean, I was, I'm good at it. I just don't like it. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't like it. But, you know, I think one of the things that people need to realize is that like you said earlier, and, and I, I just want to really bring out this point because people think, well, I can't afford to pay someone. Well, think about it this way. Let's say that 10 to $15 an hour range, right? And they're taking off the plate all the, the time consuming things that you don't do well. What if you could free up, you know, two to three hours a day. And in that two to three hours, you could sell your product, even if let's say you sell your product for a thousand dollars, let's just say, but you knew if you could have that two to three hours, you could sell a thousand dollars in that two to three hours. And you're worried about paying someone 10 to $15 an hour when they're freeing you up to sell a thousand dollars. You know, when you start thinking through the math now, don't get me wrong. I get it. Onboarding, especially when you're onboarding your first few employees and you have to do it yourself and you have to teach them everything and you have to show them the way you want it done and all these things. That's time consuming. And sometimes it's tiring, you know, because you feel like you're doing your job, their job and teaching them. But once you get them in and they're moving forward. Man, the freedom is beautiful. And all of a sudden, you have time to actually do the things in your business that make you money. Mm -hmm. Well, to your point, I mean, $10 an hour, and let's just say you have somebody 10 hours a week, that's 100 hours a week, right? And so for four hours a week, I mean, if you have for, for a month, that's $400 a month. If you, if you can't land one of your products sales in a month, that you say a thousand dollars, you're still making a margin of what 60% if you land one sale in a month while freeing up 40 hours of your time. So if you can't land one sale, you know, in 40 hours of your time, then you know, perhaps you have other problems in your business if that's the <laughs> case. But like, I mean, that's like that the the economics of that are like very straightforward. Like, and and then if you you multiply that out times, you know. Mm -hmm. bigger projects and more stuff you have to do than just it grows on itself. That's a great point. I think, I think if you, if you do the math, um, you can con convince yourself pretty quickly that, that it's worth it. Yeah. Now we've got a few minutes left, Jay, and, and you, you're not an author, which is perfectly fine. Uh, not yet. But you do have a podcast. So I'd yes. love to take the last few minutes of the show and uh, so, first of all, tell me a little bit more about your podcast. Sure. Um, so it's called The First Customer. And, uh, you know, as you know, I'm sure uh, when you run a successful business, you get questions from a lot of people and they say, how do I do that? Or how do I start? Or how do I do whatever? And I think, you know, once you cross like seven figure revenue for your business, like it becomes you, know, you a lot of people make that pivot. And I feel like. Mm -hmm. If you make one to two million dollars a year, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of people that can get there, and uh, I think a lot, at that point, a lot of people make the decision to become the guy that tells other people how to do it. And I just, I, I maybe that's me down the road, but like my me right now, I just don't feel like that's my personality. And I didn't want to be like that. I can coach you and teach you how to do 10x your business, and like I just didn't feel like that's my personality. But I. I do like mentoring people and I do like talking to people and I do like telling people how to help, you know, with their business. And I felt the podcast, uh, I mean, a year ago, my friend, Russ McCumber, he runs a, uh, an advertising agency or digital marketing agent. He was telling me, you know, you start a podcast. And I'm like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. I thought it was, I thought it was so <laughs> stupid. I was like, why, why would I do that? That's like, that's like such, it's so stupid. Like I would never do that. And today I love it. I mean, I have, you know, I do multiple of them a day, as I'm sure you have a bunch lined up and it's a fun thing to do. And the, the premise of the first customer was to answer that original question. And people ask me all the time, 
you know, how do I, how do I do it? How do I start a business? And it is about getting that first customer, getting somebody. I, I come across so many people who own businesses that have products with no customers and they don't know who, and even if they do, they don't know who their customer is, right? Like they, they, they spent tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a platform, but they don't have their customer defined. And it's like, how can you reproducibly get clients and grow your business if you don't know who your customer is? So getting to that first customer and kind of that second customer is also part of the show. It's like first customer is great. Second customer means you've built something reproducible, right? So uh, the podcast is, is uh, you know, thought leader, business owner, founder mm-hmm. kind of types meant for entrepreneurs and business owners to kind of figure out how do you get your first customer, how other people got their first customer and mm-hmm. how um, how they built kind of a mechanism to, to get past just that first one, right? Because the first one, like I said, you can you can stumble into a first customer, but really like establishing uh who you are as a business and who your customer is um i think is a really part a big part of of running successful business long term and i think some people do they run a business without ever really knowing they're just like they're just kind of winging it and they kind of you know and that's fine um that's stressful that's super stressful like if you know who your customer is though if you can picture that person if you know their you know the demographic of that person and their their pain points and all those things it makes life so much easier and it makes your sales so much easier and your marketing so much all these different things and like i said it feeds back to your product you go well maybe our product needs to be a little bit different because it's it's not serving the customer yeah. that is really buying from us like we need to pivot and change and make sure maybe our stuff is you know more offshore folks or maybe it's more onshore folks or maybe it's a different type of testing maybe it's a different you know, doing performance testing or security testing all these different things um so that's what the first customer is about. It's it's who, you know, how people got their first customer and uh, their journey uh, along the way. And a lot of people have great stories. You know, that's it's also I, I love stories. I love listening to people talk. So um, that's that's part of the podcast. You wouldn't be able to tell today. I've talked a lot, but I do like to listen. <laughs> well, see, today is your day to talk. If I come on your show, then it's my turn to talk. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to shut up and let you go for it. I'm, I can tell you that I, I'm a good, I'm a good listener. My wife will not agree, but uh, or my kids won't either, but my podcast guests think I'm a great listener. So. <laughs> okay. So now how do you translate those skills into your marriage? Hmm, maybe we'll have a discussion about that one. Maybe we'll start our own podcast about, uh, you know, how to, how to communicate with your spouse. I would love to do another podcast. That's one thing I did find out was I love doing podcasting. I love it very much. It's, it's, mm-hmm. uh, and I think ours is, I'm not going to say easy, but uh, this format where you can do some light homework, but you kind of feel it out as you go. I mean, you're a great host and I love the questions and I love all the, the field, but I, it's a very, it's fun. I would also like to try one that's um, a little more research based, like kind of presenting mm-hmm. a topic would be cool at this point. You know, I think mm-hmm. I've gotten my chops at least down enough to figure out how to do a podcast. I would love to do something informative uh, as well. So uh, it's fun. I love it. Well, you could consider, you know, uh, not only having guests on your show, but, you know, maybe doing that once a month episode where it's just you or do it as a bonus episode each month where you have that one episode where it's just you. It's something you've really researched, you know, you can present, you know, you can either have like a co-host with you, ask you questions. Uh, That's my preferred way. I, I, I can do it. I'm just don't like talking into a camera by myself i, I yeah. do much better yeah. with feedback yeah i see i think i would have that same issue but that's a great idea i like that i like the bonus episode idea or just a podcast maybe about what i actually do on a day-to-day basis uh mm-hmm. by doing software testing i didn't want to do i didn't want to do software testing because it's like it's not a sexy topic like it's never that's not our you know we're we're the last line of defense you know like we're uh we're, we're very much the the background of the, the song, but we're very necessary, but it's not necessarily something somebody we want to sit down and tune into, but maybe, I don't know. We'll see. But yeah. So anyway, that's the first customer and uh, probably have you on it at some point. That would be awesome. So Jay, we have time for one final thought and how can people connect with you? Uh, my final thought is for the love of God, if you were trying to start a business, if you want to start a business, don't wait. Just just do it. Just start doing stuff. Start reaching out to people in your network. Define what it is you want to do and just do it. Just like I, I it, it pains me. 
the amount of people I talk to that want to do it and they want to have these things and want to do a better life and want to have and run a bit. It's like, just do it. Like nobody can make you like, that's my biggest frustration. Why I don't think I could ever be a coach because I get so frustrated. I'm like, just do it. Like you have to do it. Like you just go start talking to people, start doing stuff. And I know it's much easier said than done, but like at this point in my career, I'm like, I, I know it's that easy. It is just that easy to go start. So that'd be my final thought that if anybody's listening, that's thinking about starting a business, just, do it. Reach out to your friends and family, reach out to your network, tell them you're doing this thing and somebody's going to bite. You're going to have your first customer and then you're off to the races from there. Um, to find me, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, J Agner, A-I-G-N-E-R on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, JDAQA.com is the website for my company. Um, and you can visit our LinkedIn page as well. And then the first customer uh, is firstcustomerpodcast.com. So uh, I think that's everything. <laughs> This has been Jay Agner and Kim Thompson Pinder on the Author to Authority podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you on the very next episode. Bye now.